Today, I want to look at a single verse with the message I'm entitling Expectations for 2024. Expectations. Now, there's a little bit of a twist on that. As you might think about expectations, you might think about what your expectations are. Say, for if you have a family, you have some for your kids, right? You want them to be polite. You want them to respect authority. You want them to... Uh, work with each other and not be contentious you know that's that's some expectations you have for children you probably have some for yourself i hope you do that you could be maybe timely that you would would, would be open to people and not be contentious with them and and uh, express love more and more often you know those are good expectations and and we certainly have uh, just what we talked about our goals are are kind of written expectations for ourselves what we intend to accomplish this year and we write them down there's lots of other things that's going to happen peripheral items but but we're targeting a few key elements and those are all good expectations we all should have them we all do have them but um, in this verse we're going to see that really our expectations are what do we think or what do we what are we confident of that God is going to do what can we expect from him he's really reliable you know the God of the universe so what are our expectations of him based on the word and what he's recorded for us. You know, I, I think of this verse whenever we do goals. It's in the Proverbs. The horse is prepared for battle. That's your goal. But victory is of the Lord. Right? So when you have the victory, you don't thank your horse. If you're a godly man or a woman, you thank God. Although you did prepare the horse. So, you know, this is that, that uh, collection of... Uh, uh, man's ability and God's sovereignty working together. The horse is prepared for battle, but victory is of the Lord. And so that's our goals. We expect certain things in those goals as we work to achieve them. And, and it's great, David, your ministry there for us has gotten me on board. And, uh, it's, you know, you're accountable to yourself, really, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Am I doing any of these things? Uh, yes, that's good. So that was an excellent bit of ministry. We want to kind of uh, cleave off of that today. So the verse, which I gave you uh, in an email, Psalm 62, 5, in the King James, I have it here. My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation, there it is, is from him. Hmm. Now, a lot of your translations say my hope is from him. And we'll look at that uh, second half of the verse as we get uh, into this message. But let's look at that first half. My soul, wait thou only upon upon God. Now, I don't know how many times this comes up, but it, it's often that you're told to wait on the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Well, a wait can mean a lot of things. I, I could be in the middle of a discussion with a whole lot of people talking. I might say, wait, 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 wait. Like, just put all that on hold for a second. I, I need to interject. That's one way to wait. Or you can tell your kid that you wait right here and don't move, right? Good luck on that. <laughs> wait right here. And that means stop everything. Right, just just wait. We're not going to go. We're not going to go anywhere. We're not going to do anything. I don't want any good ideas. Just wait. Could be like a shutdown. But that's maybe not what it means here. My soul, wait thou only on God. Does it mean to delay, like to, to be late or something, to stop? And we always heard the phrase, well, I'm just waiting on the Lord. But apparently the horse is not prepared for battle, right? If you're just waiting on the Lord all the time. So what does it mean? Well, if you look it up, uh, in, in the original language, in the Hebrew, it just it means, like you'd look it up in a dictionary, it means to be silent or to be still. That's how it's translated in the, in the definition. And one way it's used, and we're going to look at three or four references of it to help us understand. When Joshua, in I think it's chapter 10 of the book of Joshua, remember what did he do to the sun? He caused it to stand still. The word still is the same word as my soul, wait thou only on God. So that in that sense, it's just true the definition, to be still, not to move like that, like that little toddler you told to stand there. But does that is that all it means? You know the the Hebrew language, and we're going to see it in a, in a bigger way in a second, is so rich that we can't just rest on the definition of a word. You know etymology. That's not all. It's it's a very widely use. These words are plugged into different contexts and they can mean not different things but fuller meanings of the same word. So this word wait is what we're exploring. My soul wait thou only upon God. You know how the NIV translate that? My soul find rest 
in God. You see how the translators are saying, hmm, what does wait mean? Well, those translators decide to say, they, they decided that it means to rest in the Lord, only in Him. Well, that's different to me than waiting, isn't it? Mm. To rest in Him, I mean, there is a stillness there, there is a silence in a sense. But that's how they looked at it. And you see that word, Psalm 37, 7, says, rest in the Lord, wait patiently for Him. Well, there it is. It's the same word. To wait is to rest. But the NIV translators translated that, be still in the Lord. So again, many, many translators, and this is what's great about translations, is they are striving to, to bring the meaning of the verse out, all of the good translations. And so it's, it's good to be aware of how, how verses are translated, not just um, land on one translation. Rest in the Lord, wait patiently for him. So maybe it means to rest. Well, one verse we can kind of all settle on, all the translators, is a, one of my favorite psalms. It's very short, Psalm 131, 2. And it says, But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. And all the translators use this word quieted for the word wait in 62.5. I have calmed and quieted my soul that's the word like a wean child with his mother i think of puppies you know puppies are just nursing like frantically right they're looking for that opportunity and they're, they're crawling over each other and that's that's a non-wheel child pat yeah okay so so that's but then when they're weaned you know i was talking to mary this morning they're 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 uh they're nourished they're they're satisfied mm -hmm. There's not that seeking and urgency and that chaos, you know, I got, I got, I got, I got, I got. No, I'm, I'm quieted. See, it makes sense because wait, be still, be silent, rest, quieted. My soul, wait thou only upon God. You see how the, the Old Testament is trying to show us what it means to wait on God. It doesn't mean to stop and do nothing. Look at another Psalm, Psalm 4, um, 3 through 4. But no... That the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry, do not sin, ponder in your own hearts on your beds, and be silent. That's the same word, be silent. Well, wait a minute. It says, the Lord hears when I call to him, and then it says, be silent. Can you have it both ways? Well, yeah, depending on how you want to look at this word, wait. Mm. So what does it mean? To wait is, is, is this, this idea of, resting in him and i think of prayer and, and uh, making requests of god when we're interacting with him as our father we need to in our asking in our praying which is all good they said lord teach us to pray and he said when you pray say this father that's the first word out of your mouth that's who you're praying to your heavenly father so he says, when you pray, say, Father. When you ask your Father, it's, it's said here to wait on him, to be quieted in him, to rest in him, to rest in his will, to rest in his purposes. Um, and, and I think that gives us the, the broader meaning. My soul, that is who I am, everything about me, rest thou only upon God. It's beautiful when you look at it. You know, there's a parable in, in the Gospel of Luke, the parable of the unjust judge. And that's where this, this uh, lady who has apparently got a, an issue with the law, someone has betrayed her, and she goes to this just, and she unjust, this judge who is unjust, she continually asks him to give her justice, give me justice, justice, I want justice. Not quieted, right? And then the judge says, okay, great, I'll give you justice, just be quiet, you know, just stop pestering me. And then it says... And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Mm -hmm. Will he delay long over them? And another translation says, will he keep putting them off? Mm -hmm. Does God ever put you off? Mm -hmm. Never. Mm -hmm. God never will put you mm -hmm. off. You pray in faith and trust and knowing who you're praying to, your father. Uh, what's it say? First John 514 this is the confidence that we have towards him that if we ask anything according to his will he hears us whoa 
anything according to what he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we've asked of him. Does that mean every prayer is going to be answered just like you want it to be? No, we know that from experience. Mm -hmm. But we do know that when we ask our Father, he always hears us and he never puts us off. He never says, now, you know, you've asked that already. <laughs> Listen, I've got prayers. Mary and I are praying every day and we're not stopping because it's a good prayer. Mm -hmm. It's the right prayer. It's the prayer to ask unresolved conflicts and things like this continue to seek your heavenly father and this whole idea of delaying will he delay long over them well listen if you're a young child and i say to my my young child uh he asked me something i say well we'll get we'll get we'll get around to that well, what does that mean to him like okay two minutes no, I mean three days, you know, or something. I mean, the perception is different between a young child and the parent, right? Our idea of time and theirs is, is completely different. So you need to be real specific, a little parenting there. You need to be real specific. No, I'll, I'll do that a little bit later once I'm done with the dishes or whatever you're going to say. So, but the children, like us, our perception of time and God's is much different. God has things to do, I'll have to say. And when we interject a prayer into the world, into his, into his purposes, he hears us and he works these things somehow in a, in a divine and a beautiful way into his purposes. So I'd like to encourage us all as a little fellowship this year, as one of your goals is put it in your head, to pray more um, fervently, more targeted, with more confidence, that when you pray certain things to God that are very important to you on your heart, and each person has their own burdens, that you lift them up to God as your Heavenly Father. He loves you. He's, he's for you. And He hears you as you pray in His will. And that's what waiting thou only upon God must mean. Hmm. Wait on Him. Be quieted. Don't be urgent. Be confident then when you speak to your Heavenly Father, you're speaking to the one that loves you with an everlasting love, mm -hmm. who has come into this world, given himself for you, wants the very best for you, all in the context of what his greater and higher purposes are yeah. for you. And, and I love, I love uh, Ephesians 3.20. Uh, he gives abundantly, exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can <laughs> ask or even think. Sometimes we don't pray stuff, we just think about things. Well, he's on that too. And he's going to give more and more and more of what pleases him in context of what your requests are. So you pray for your children, pray for your spouse, you pray for this nation, you pray for Israel, you pray for uh, the believers around you, you pray for the unsaved, all of that. You continue to pray. You cry to him day and night. He will not put you off. That's what it says. I believe that. My soul, wait thou only upon God. Now, my expectation is from him. My hope is from him. Now, you probably heard it said, worth repeating. As the Bible talks about hope, it's much different than our hope. Now, I hope the Bills win tonight, but that's about it. <laughs> okay? But that's not biblical hope. Biblical hope is absolute confidence in the thing happening. And I can't be confident about it really much on the world. I don't know what's going to happen with a lot of things, but I can have hope in certain things, mm -hmm. absolute confidence. And that's what we want to do. My hope, my expectation, what I expect from God, if we can put it that way, is sure. I'm absolutely confident. Why? Because he says it is work. Mm -hmm. So I, my confidence and my expectation, this word hope, now this is where the Hebrew language gets so beautiful. And, and I just, I, I'm always encouraged about doing word studies. My favorite thing to do. The word hope, if you look it up as, as just a definition, you know what it means? A rope. That's it. A cord, a rope of some kind. And it's used that way in lots of different passages. You know how it's used one way? It shows you a little bit about what it really means, the higher meaning. When Rahab was mm -hmm. speaking to those spies... And she acknowledged that there's only one God. It's the God of, of, the, of the Jews. It's Jehovah. It's Yahweh Elohim. It's the one God. And she acknowledged that to them. And she hid them and protected them. When they left, what did they say? 
listen, we're going to come back and I want to see a scarlet thread, it says, or a line, some translations say, a rope hung out a window. And when I see that, we'll, we'll spare you. We're going to destroy the city, but we'll spare you. And so she did that. Her scarlet expectation. Mm. See that? Mm. That's how it's used. It's beautiful. So when she put that rope out the window, that was her absolute confidence mm -hmm. that she would be saved. That's what we need from the Lord. We expect mm -hmm. certain things from him. Mm -hmm. One thing we expect is, and this kind of gets beyond individual goals now. Our goals are our goals. But God has some other things that are very high and very precious that we need to expect from him. One is that he will be faithful. And that's sort of a general term. What, you know, what does that mean to be faithful? One is he will be faithful to his word. If you find the word somewhere, something that God has promised, rest on it. Be confident in it. Expect it to be true because it's God's word. And he cannot lie. He cannot deceive us in any way. I want to look at a couple of passages, and I'll just give you the references, and I'll read them out. Hebrews 6, 17 through 19. Let me read this for you. Yeah, this is a little tricky, but pay attention. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. Mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty sure. There's a lot of assurance in that passage. Now, what about these two unchangeable things? I read this and I said, well, what are they? When I'm looking back, well, I don't see one, two. Well, here they are. He promised some things to Abraham, and then he guaranteed it with an oath. That's two things. He got the promise, and he even made an oath to keep his promise. And he can't lie, and these are unchangeable. So can we rest in these? Can we have confidence and expectations in these things? Absolutely, because God's character is on the line. He said it. And what are those things? Well, if you study this out and you take, you take the, uh, this passage, which is obviously speaking about Abraham and all his promises, and I'll make you a father of many nations, all the things we might have just recently read, if you're reading through the Bible, you take it into the book of Galatians in the New Testament and it tells us some things. Uh, three nine. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. He was faithful. We are faithful and loyal to him. And we are blessed like Abraham was. Amen. Well, blessed in what way? 3.14. That the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Huh? To the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Here it is. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. That's one of the promises. When the Lord was speaking to Nicodemus, he said, don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And the word again really means, uh, could mean from above. And he's talking about a spiritual birth because he says it later. He talks about the earthly, the physical birth and the spiritual birth. He talks about the spirit as operating in a way you can't understand, like the wind. It's all about the spirit. We are spiritually born people. We have a spirit. The promise of the spirit has been fulfilled in all believers in the Lord Jesus. And that's part of the blessings of Abraham, that we would live in a spiritual world, a spiritual kingdom, function in a spiritual way, apart from the, the world and all the world offers, that we could just be in another place, kind of, living in a spiritual way. Our expectation is from him. What else does he say for us? Romans 8.35 Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword? That's what we call a rhetorical question. <laughs> What's the answer? None of those things. Nothing. None of those things. Really? Those are pretty serious. Yeah, I know. And there's a lot of believers going through those things right now. We're sitting comfy in our living room. They're not. 
But this verse is as true to them as it is to us. Mm -hmm. Tribulation, persecution, famine, nakedness, sword, even death. Mm -hmm. Who shall separate us from what? The love of Christ. Mm -hmm. We can expect that. Mm -hmm. God's love in Christ is 100% signed and sealed. Mm -hmm. And we can rest in that. We can expect that. That he loves us even, does that mean we're not going to go through these things? No, it doesn't mean that. It means the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. That when you go through these things, the love of Christ will not be diminished in any way. No, in all these things that are going to happen or could happen to you, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being persecuted, I'm being knocked down, I'm naked, I'm, I'm in great danger, I'm in fear for my life, and you're telling me that I'm a conqueror? Well, it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to get out of any of these things, although you could. God can deliver miraculously. Yeah. But one thing you can be sure of, one thing you can be expectant of, of God, is that he loves you. Mm -hmm. That might seem kind of strange to most people. Well, why, if he loved me, why would this go? Well, there's other reasons. There's other peripheral reasons God is doing and working in his world that we can be confident in as well. Another passage, and of course we could go on all morning, the Lord Jesus himself said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Now there's a lot of talk, and I've been reading a lot of things about the rapture and the millennial kingdom and all of this stuff, all of this stuff we call eschatology. But I'm sorry, not sorry. The Lord said this. He said it, and he said it to his disciples, who were going to also say it to other people. And you read it in other passages in the scripture, I will come again. I don't know when he's going to come again. I don't know what context he's going to come in necessarily. I don't know the timing of it. Uh, he even said he didn't even necessarily know, and we certainly don't know the day or the hour. But he did say, I will come again. <laughs> And I'm not giving that up. I don't know where you're all at on that, but I am not giving that up. That is a promise I expect it to happen. Would it be fantastic? Would it be supernatural? Oh, yeah. Would the world ever be the same when it happens? No, it would never be the same. But he came. There's many examples of miraculous things happening in history in the Old Testament. And this is a great unfulfilled promise that God has that I I'll just speak for myself. I am absolutely expectant of it to happen. Mm -hmm. It's called the blessed hope mm -hmm. and the great appearing of our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. You can't throw that off. You can't, mm -hmm. and something's going to happen. Something in some context at some time. Maybe not in my mm -hmm. lifetime, but maybe maybe soon. I don't know. All right, mm -hmm. let's, let's look at one more mm -hmm. aspect of how we can expect things from God. He's going to be faithful to his word. He's going to be faithful to his nature, to who he is. This is everything to me. When you learn who God is, you learn his attributes, and you understand how he expressed himself in many ways, especially this is where reading through the Bible is fantastic because you're going to see him in all his colors, all his ways, his wrath, his justice, his mercy, his loving kindness, all on display as you read through. One thing about his nature, and I want to look at this interesting verse here. We, we hear this first part of the, of the verse very often, for I, the Lord, do not change. Like I'm just, I don't do anything different. Everything is all pre-programmed. Everything's prescribed. Uh, I, the Lord, do not change. Is that what it means to do not change? Kind of like getting back to our, what does wait mean? We'll read the rest of the verse. Therefore, and that's the key. I do not change. Therefore, O children of Jacob, you are not consumed. Well, I'm glad that he doesn't change in that way. But does God change in his responses to things? We could, again, take the rest of the morning looking at all the ways that God has responded to something someone has done. I just read uh, in the Bible, Abimelech, when, uh, when Abraham uh, went down there and lied about his wife and all that, and then he says, re uh, God says, return his wife and live, don't return him and die. Well, those are two clear choices for Abimelech. Which one are you going to do? Now, God's going to be in either choice, right? That's just the way it works. But there is where the Lord is giving out some information, and then he's waiting on the response of Abimelech, in a sense, 
and moving in that direction, and all in the context of his overall purposes. But look at the rest of it. Return to me, and I'll return to you, says the Lord of hosts. There it is again. God is looking. He's looking for the heart. All souls are mine, it says. And he's looking for the response of our hearts all the time. Now, as believers, as, as his people, he is looking for the response of our hearts to his nature. I, the Lord, do not change. Another expectation I have, based on his word, and this is good for us, is that we will experience inner spiritual growth this year in our hearts, in our souls. We will grow spiritually. Remember, we're spiritual people. And we're, we're living in a, in, a, in a tent, you know, like the Bible describes our bodies, and we're operating day to day in, in a secular world, and that's okay. And God has put us here for lots of reasons. But one thing we can be sure of, and I've got a, a three nice verses. You might write these down and meditate on them. 1 Thessalonians 3.12 And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love, one toward another, toward all men, even as I do towards you. The Lord's working in your heart. One thing I've learned about prayer, and I was, I was not able to find a specific verse, but there are times where the Lord directs a heart. It's like, well, how can he just go make me do something? Well, I don't know how it all works out, but he directs our hearts. It's okay to pray. I pray for my son, Luke. Lord, direct his heart to you. That's a good prayer. I'll leave that with God, to work in his life in such a way that he'll respond. And this is how it is. The Lord make you to increase and abound in love one towards another. What do, what do, we, want to, what, what do we want to accomplish as a fellowship? It's... It's to have a deeper love for one another and a love for others. That, that's it. And, and we're seeing it happen. I'm, I'm experiencing it in my life in this fellowship. I mean, you can know somebody and then you can know them in a better in a deeper way. And that's what we, we want to see in, in a fellowship of, of the Lord's people. Another verse. We know this one quite well. 2 Corinthians 3.18. Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord... We are being transformed into that from glory to glory. That's a promise. That's an expectation. Mm -hmm. That as I behold the glory of the Lord and just his greatness and his majesty, his wonder, his splendor, as I behold that through nature and through experiences and through all the things that come to us and then great miracles of prayer answered and things that we've seen even this last year, mm -hmm. as I behold that, I am being conformed and transformed into that image that's that's amazing I mean, that, it's like really that's happening mm -hmm. and so people will see that they're going to see you're different you're you're different than you were and that's what we want to see this year we want to be a little different than we were last year mm -hmm. amen. amen and then the last one second thessalonians 3 5 here it is the lord directs your hearts into the love of god you can pray that for yourself. Father, direct my hearts into the love of Christ. That's one thing about just the conventional prayer meetings is we can't get into the real prayer life that we need to be in. Praying for our souls, praying for the growth of our spirits and our devotion to him. It all becomes very transactional. Praying for this thing and that thing and and uh, journeys, mercies, and all these sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Fine. How about this? Direct our hearts, Lord, into your love mm -hmm. and into the patient waiting for Christ. Christ said, I will come again. And the Lord direct my hearts into that patient waiting. That, that gets back to the verse, my soul, wait thou only upon God. Be silent. Be at rest. Mm -hmm. We see the world in turmoil around us. Be at rest. Paul said, I am troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Isn't that great? Mm -hmm. Troubled and perplexed. Oh, you must not have enough faith or something, right? No. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. I don't understand why all the things are happening that are happening. We are perplexed, hmm, but not in despair. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between being a little confused about something Amen. and being a mess. Amen. 
okay? And I think on social media, the more we read news, the more we're bombarded with all this, these thoughts, which are real, there's things happening out there, it's good to know about them, good to be in prayer about them, good to know in many ways, but they cannot cause us to despair because there's just too much on the line. God is too good to us as his children for us to be all concerned to the point of despair of what's going on in the world. God is working through the world we live in. It, it's, not, it's not just flying off the handles. We don't see it yet. Again, we're, we're, we're the toddler. Wait, God is the adult. He knows what's happening. He knows why it's all happening. Down to the very individual experience that you might have. He knows. He knows why it's happening. And he's working through it and working through your response in it. And we cannot forget that. So our expectations for the Lord. Well, we want to wait on him. We want to be still. We want to quiet our soul like a weaned child. And then we want to expect things from him, that he would be true to his word. Lord, this is what you said. That he would be true to his nature. Lord, this is who you are. Mm -hmm. And that he would also uh, work in our lives to cause us to grow in a spiritual way. Mm -hmm. To be more and more pleasing to him. What's the most important thing? Paul says, I make it my aim to be pleasing to him. Mm -hmm. That sort of covers everything. Mm -hmm. Covers my behavior. Covers my speech. Covers my interactions with everyone mm -hmm. outside <laughs> the church, in the church. My desire, my goal, my aim is to be pleasing to him, and it should be for all of us. Mm -hmm.